water for all. She has also served in several boards, including ATRI and uh, Sangamitra Rural Financial Services. She is a committed philanthropist and continues to fund work in areas such as governance and accountability, independent media, education and research, and environmental sustainability. <coughs> Rohini Nilakani will deliver the inaugural address. May I request Rohini Nilakani to please come up. Uh, we also have with us Mr. P.R. Dasgupta, Distinguished Fellow and Senior Director, the Energy and Resources Institute at the Southern Regional Center, Bangalore, to deliver the welcome address. Mr. Dasgupta is a retired IS officer and has worked in various distinguished positions with the Government of India as well as the Government of Maharashtra and various state governments. He is the Director of Bangalore International Center since its inception 11 years back, and he's been working with the Energy and Resources Institute and providing his guidance to the center here in Bangalore. So I request to please take the seat here. We also have Mr. KJ Joy, a senior fellow at SOPECOM, who is an activist researcher for more than 30 years and coordinates the national level network on water conflicts, which is known as the Forum for Policy Dialogues on Water Conflicts in India. Mr. Joy is is uh, an extremely uh, uh, well-known person in the area of water conflicts, and I need not introduce him. Uh, I request uh, Mr. Joy to please come over and also deliver the <laughs> opening remarks and introduction later. Um, I'm very delighted to be here. Um, I have a long, of course, very happy here to be at this auditorium. Thanks to Terry, to Professor Das Gupta. It's always nice to meet you. Um, old colleagues um, and friends from uh, the Forum for Water Conflicts, Professor Janak Rajan, Joy, my colleagues at ATRI, my young colleagues from Algyama here, and very happy to see such a young crowd of people who are going to spend the next four days diving deeply into some one of the most important questions in the country and possibly around the world today, uh, the management of conflicts around this key resource, water. Um, I thought that my first disclaimer is that I am not an expert. Um, I have set up a foundation called Argyam, who some of you may have heard of 12 years ago. So I've engaged with the water sector for 12 years now very deeply. I knew nothing about it before. I know something about it now. But every day I learn more, as you are going to in the next four days. Um, I've had the occasion to learn from people like Joy and uh, Professor Janak Rajan and certainly the people at ATRI. So what I share f with you all today is really coming from a bit of that perspective, but also because I have been involved in a lot of civil society activities over the last 20 years and supported a lot of work of the amazing NGOs that do incredible work all around the country. And also because my husband Nandan Nilekini has been in the corporate sector for the last 35 years, I've kind of had a ringside seat to see how, you know, different fora in the world interact on issues like resource management and how the business community is responding to things and challenges. So I thought that because you are going to meet so many water experts in the next four days, and certainly I'm not one, I thought I'll come to you from a perspective from outside, trying to see upstream non-water sector uh, linkages to see how they also ref impact on the conflicts that you all are going to be diving deep into, and perhaps to see if uh, we can come at it from many different lenses. So um, with a short notice I got for this, uh, I put together something, so let's see how that goes. Uh, I think the importance of this workshop cannot be underestimated. You all are very lucky, all 28, 29 of you, to be here for four days doing a deep dive into this issue and guided by some of the finest people in the sector. Um, so, you know, really dig your heads down deep, and I, I cannot, again, under uh, overemphasize the importance of doing things like this. I'm very glad that we're also recording this so that hopefully this training material can go to more than 30 people. And um, I look forward to seeing more and more people delve into this. So the first thing I think I can, all of us can agree on is that conflicts are opportunities, okay? Sustainable shifts of paradigm can happen, can emerge from deep conflicts. I won't go into too many examples. I don't have th that much time. Vina, call out to me if I'm exceeding my time. 
I'll refer to only one fairly familiar example, World War II with its tens of millions of casualties and a deep realignment of the world's politics did, did allow for one thing to happen, which is the engagement of women in the workforce, in the work, formal work sector. And there has been no looking back. I mean, uh, since the, 14, the last eight decades, women have taken back more and more space in the world to improve their own economic opportunities. So I always think of that as one example coming out of a bloody, horrible, possibly the worst human conflict in human history. Um, of course, that does not mean we go out there to create conflicts deliberately because there's no linear path. We can't create conflicts to yield beneficial side effects. But we need to acknowledge here today that conflicts actually, if you look at them carefully, as in fact Joy and colleagues have been doing for 10 years now, can yield a lot of information about resources, about competition, about mismanagement, about power structures, and about latent demand, to name just a few things. So looking at these conflicts dispassionately uh, with a partly academic and very humane perspective can really be the first step towards reducing or preventing conflict. So analyzing them, devising taxonomy, a typology as, uh, as uh, Joy and others have done uh, becomes extremely useful so that we can create a whole basket of approaches towards resolving current conflicts and trying to prevent future ones. <coughs> so that's what you are here to study and um, all the experts will be uh, guiding you through this over the next four days. All of us when we want to when we look at this, we say, do we really want to eliminate all conflicts? Because as I just said, conflicts actually yield a lot of information for solutions. We have to think about whether we really want to eliminate all conflict, but it's useful, as they say in the sector, to have a big, hairy, audacious goal, B-H-A-G, to say there will be no more conflict around water. If you keep that as a far away vision and then work systematically towards it, who knows what will happen one day. We have a long way to go, though. And I think that sometimes I've seen in these 12 years that those of us who engage in the water sector often come from a water mindset. And sometimes that could limit opportunities to look for solutions. And so I urge all of you to sometimes step outside the sector, look very high up upstream at linkages like I told you before, to see whether while we are looking here, Something exciting is happening somewhere else that will reduce the need for us to do this work here. So for example, if we think of two main reasons why there are conflict shortages, and perhaps, uh, so quality issues and quantity issues. Very broadly speaking, I'm sure y'all can come up with more. Then we can immediately see how many externalities there are in the question of both quantity and quality. I'm not going to get much time to focus on quality issues, but I'm sure you're going to see a lot of that coming from your ATRI um, uh, faculty. Um, but let's look at some of the other things. So agriculture, industry, culture, personal choices, and of course climate change. There are so many things, determinants of water conflicts. So let's see, let's take shortage for example. So to prevent conflicts or reduce their negative impact, at least here in India, one of the arguments I have been making is that if we want there to be less conflicts emerging out of the lack of water, we need to start moving towards, officially moving towards a low water economy. In India, all of you must be aware that we have some history and tradition of being a low water society, coming from a deeply ecological perspective, uh, a perspective of ecological and intergenerational justice. People have always thought of water as a valued sort of resource that should not be wasted just like that. So in a sense, we have a lot of rich tradition of being a low water society. Can we therefore become also a low water economy? As our, as our governments, um, uh, uh, draw us into the narrative of a high growth economy to lift people out of poverty, etc. Can we also simultaneously look at being a low growth water economy? And what does that all mean? Can we move towards using less and less water in the entire design, the processes, and design is very important. How can you design systems to use less water? 
How can you improve processes so that they use less water? And how can you look across the supply chains of agriculture, of industry, and in also of, um, of urbanization? When we design these next 7,000 towns that need to be updated with public infrastructure, how can we rethink water infrastructure so that the towns reduce their water footprint? What does this require? This will require immense data collection and analysis and dissemination, but in a very transparent manner so that all stakeholders can see progress or otherwise. Farmers, corporations, city managers need to have some kind of idea of what is their water footprint and then to be able to set very ambitious goals for reducing it. So I feel that we must keep an eye out for all the amazing new emerging technologies that make it possible to bring this data together from diverse sources, crowdsourced, sourced through research, sourced through government data, primary data, secondary data. Uh, so many new technologies have made it easier to do all of those things. And then more technologies that enable us to create better visualization of this data so that more and more people can understand it better. Um, Okay, a side, side comment. Uh, recently I was, I'm, I'm dropping names here, I must admit. I was with Alejandro Inaritu. Who knows who that is? Anybody? Yeah? Yes. That's right, the Oscar winning director. And you know, instead of making the next movie, you know what he's planning to do? He's very concerned about the issue of migrants, refugees, and immigration around the world. So his next movie is going to be a kind of a, part partially a documentary using virtual reality. And when I asked him why are you doing that, he says when you can allow people to immerse in the, in the situation of a refugee on a boat coming from Syria, for example, then you help people to improve their empathy. So if we want to sort of exercise the empathy muscle without which you really cannot reduce any conflicts in the world, uh, Mr. Das Gupta referred to Vasudeva Eka Kutumbam. Unless we all begin to improve our empathy and understanding, putting ourselves in the place of others, I can't imagine reducing any kinds of conflict, including water conflict. So I brought this in because think of virtual rea reality. If we can create water consciousness, um, for example, in the same way too, uh, imagine, imagine allowing people to directly experience through technologies like virtual reality, augmented reality and other things. The plight of people in the Bihar floods, the plight of people in the middle of the Kaveri uh, basin situation, in the droughts, we know the situation. I, imagine immersing yourself in Vidarbha or Marathwada or in Orissa where the Mahanadi uh, issues are coming up. What will that mean in terms of moving forward dialogues, discourses. Um, I think this could have a role, and I think the water practitioner community, all the people who are gathered here today have a role to play in feeding the creative imagination of people who are going to create such multimedia uh, efforts. I don't think we should knock this because I think that's the way the world is moving and we have to learn to move with them. In fact, the young people in this room are going to be able to teach all your course people a thing or two. So I look forward to that interaction. You know, there is a game my son uh, uh, pointed me to called Fate of the World. It is meant for ordinary citizens to begin to address the extraordinarily complex problems we are facing in human history today. I mean, more complex than ever with Sometimes we all feel so helpless. How on earth, for example, are we going to look at climate change? What can we possibly do? Fate of the world allows you to actually immerse in a global kind of uh, game. It's very serious gaming. It's a phenomenal game where you get to imagine if you were a policy maker, how would you resolve things? What would you do about climate change? What policies would you think of? And you can do it all safely without having to be violent on the streets. And I think, I feel that these are not to be knocked. These are simple things. By the way, in that game, there is one scenario where water stress cripples India. So India and water are very much on the map around the world. Um, so I think we have a sophisticated 
basket of technology is the back end of these very serious gaming techniques. You have machine learning, you have big data analytics, um, you have uh, artificial intelligence. And as these emerge, all of us in the water sector have to keep an eye out to see how can we use these technologies to achieve our common societal goals. Um, now to move to another thing, you already know all this, but um, uh, uh, Peter Gleick from the Pacific Institute, whom I'm going to refer to a couple of times, I had the privilege of meeting him before. Amazing uh, a man, comes up with very new ideas that shape the thinking of the world. Um, <clears throat> he's, they've been, some people have been talking about the world already being at peak water, like peak oil. All of you have heard of peak oil. Now peak water seems to be quite a contestable idea because unlike oil, water is a, on an annual renewable cycle. <clears throat> However, it's important for us to think of all that because what it essentially means is that we are using up our fossil water, we are taking all our renewable water and using it only for human use, starving the ecological uh, needs of the planet, um, and therefore that's what we're really talking about, reaching physical, environmental, and economic limits on meeting human demands for water and the subsequent decline of availability. So as we think about that, as I said, conflicts are always opportunities. What happens when you hit peak water? Look at what's happening in oil. Look at what's happening to commodity prices around the world as you reach peak levels of commodity use or commodity availability or economic viability of using those commodities. At some parts, in some parts of the world then, we seem to have already reached peak water demand. Again, I'm not the expert, somebody can contest me, I have looked at some things because I find these trends interesting. Um, so again, to quote Peter Gleick, the latest data, and this was some time ago for five years, uh, for, have, had been released in 2014, and they show the continuation and acceleration of a stunning trend. US water withdrawals for all purposes are declining, not growing. And believe me, I think in five years we'll be reading this about China. The world's largest economies, China and the US, are coming to grips with their water situation and rapidly innovating their way out of excess water use. In five years, mark my words, you will see similar data coming out of China. They are working very aggressively to reduce water footprint. India is at that cusp. Let's see what you people come up with in the next four days. So per capita consumption in some parts of the world is also going down with more efficiencies built into taps, pumps, pipes, shower heads, all kinds of things that everyone uses in their everyday economic and personal lives. European cities are moving their norms of LPCD downwards. So they've come down to 100 LPCD from 135 or whatever it used to be because they have found that we don't need more than 100 liters per person per day in an urban environment because of all the efficiencies they've generated through reuse and all sorts of other things by making the cycles of water use smaller. So that's very interesting to us in India as we look at how are the next 8,000 towns and cities of India going to develop? Can we take the 135 LPCD norm that we have today down to 100, multiply that by the number of people and you get significant water savings? And you know where I'm headed when I'm talking about reducing water demand in order to impact on water conflicts in the future. Um, uh, my young colleague helped me here. A recent study, you know, people's eating choices are also making a difference. Uh, so keep your minds open to all these things. A recent study attempts to deepen the understanding of the impact of diets on resource use by analyzing the effects of changes in diets on consumptive water use at a country level and at a global level. By, it first analyzed the impact of modifying diets to fulfill the dietary guidelines by the WHO, and then the effect of shifting from animal-based food products, like meat, to a more plant-based diet. In both analyses, the diet composition was kept as close as original to the traditional and culturally acceptable food composition. So not asking people to shift to some vague thing like mushrooms if you've been used to eating ragi. And in both, um, the study found that by reducing animal product consumption, global green water use would be reduced by 21%. And the effect on blue water use in food production would be about 14%. 
Now think about this, the less meat people eat and the more they care about say local, organic, artisanal um, uh, produce, um, what impact it can have on water futures. And never forget, whether we like it or not, that the elites create the changing standards that others still like to follow, even if they don't want to admit it. India's people and their changing food habits will impact global green water use quite significantly. And one, and one way to minimize future water conflicts in India would definitely be to include a national information campaign. Those of you who are in the media or in research, a national information campaign on both nutrition and embedded water and its, its, uh, its impact, its, uh, uh, it's a reflection on how we produce food in this country. <coughs> Producing food in agriculture the world over, as you all know, efforts are on to produce more crop per drop and to respond to climate change driven changes in rainfall, both in terms of location and quantity. And believe it or not, farmers in the US are taking a relook, a new look at dry land farming. They've had so much drought in the last few years, they are rethinking how to have rain-fed agriculture, but with much more innovations in technology. They're thinking of some kind of uh, water membranes that will be put over crops and stuff, which I was reading about with fascination. I read some, heard some talks about also. So think, if we start thinking like that, the whole scenario of water availability begins to change. Um, because they've understood that it is less about maximizing this year's crop as to worrying about protecting the crops of future years because they can see the patterns now. So sometimes I feel in India that we have not yet caught up in the technological race and that's to our advantage because now we can perhaps retain some of our water wisdom but bring in new technology so that we don't go the wasteful way of the West and come back to where we are right now. So we have the capability now to look at diverse perspectives and diverse data sources to build out models for future water use in India. And the key, I think, for practitioners like you is to keep pushing for data to be democratically collected, to be kept on open platforms, and to be shared transparently. The work that Argyam and his partners has done in participatory groundwater management over the last six years, and with some of the people whom you are going to meet in the next four days, has time and time again proved to us that when you put relevant data democratically gathered in the hands of people and communities. They are much more likely to devise their own creative social protocols, their restraint practices, create right price signaling or whatever other incentives that are required to manage water much more equitably and perhaps a little more sustainability. Sustainably, sorry. Let me come quickly to industry. I think it, we often see Sometimes in the water sector, because we don't know how to talk to industry, uh, we, th we kind of paint them in a certain way or label them. But let me tell you, industry is completely incentivized right now. It's under extreme duress and needs to use less and less water throughout its production processes. Small factories in India probably suffer the most. Um, recently, I was reading about a garment factory in Bellari that had to let quarter its production because there was simply no water. And this story will, will be repeated a million times around the country today. Uh, similarly, large companies, Mahindra, Mahindra and Mahindra, had to actually shut down one plant in uh, Maharashtra because they simply could not get water. So believe me, industry is very sensitive to this question of water. And most large corporations can't get away with bad practices and they are responding. And the government is also responding. In April, uh, Environment Minister Zaudekar said that India will aim to reduce industrial water usage by half in the next five years by using the latest technologies to uh, reuse, recover, recycle water. These are things worth holding government to. If you say that, you should show that you mean it, and we are all there watching you as citizens. We talk of surveillance and worry about surveillance all the time, but there is such a thing as surveillance, SOUS surveillance, which means looking, at, looking up from below, and that can create a very powerful push on the supply side to change behavior and be more publicly accountable. Never forget the power of surveillance. Meanwhile, 
bigger corporations around the world and in India signing on to a global campaign for water disclosure. How much water are you using, both in your factory, inside your fence, and how much are you using throughout your supply chain? Whether it's the beverage companies, the infotech companies, hospitality, automotive, and of course, agro companies, they are really trying to get more efficiency from the water, often for uh, economic reasons and often for because of public pressure, which it is our job to keep putting on them. It's getting harder for them to get the water they need, whether from the utilities or from the ground or from the rain. They're also kind of, you know, it helps when people um, are able to set standards, achieve them, and get awarded and recognized for them. So companies that achieve zero discharge or reduce their pollution or improve their water efficiency are getting recognized in the world. And this is one, kind of one of the drivers for industry. So it's there are, of course, I know you all are going to hear the dark side of many things. There are many rogue sectors, energy, mining, that have not caught up with this at all. And that, that gives us an opportunity to say, look, if these guys can do it, why can't you? Uh, you all know about wastewater. You're going to be hearing about that. It's also coming. There's a lot more increasing sensitivity about wastewater reuse. And the good news is that in India, we are so bad at it that the only way is up. We certainly can't get worse, so we are going to get better. So what I'm trying to say in all this, that we might be looking at a future, in fact, in the next 20, after 20 years or so, we may actually have contained global and hopefully Indian demand for more and more fresh water. And to me, that is a really positive way of looking at reducing or preventive, preventing conflict. Can I take five more minutes, Veena? I'm going to just quote Peter Gleick, who talks to us about um, how, how he has looked at the consumption of human human consumption of water over the years. So he says the first stage of water was when human civilization had barely begun. And water was just something we took from the natural environment where we needed it. Is this already going to be in the course? Am I being repetitive? No, no, go ahead. But as populations grew, as civilization expanded, and as cities developed, we outgrew our local water resources. And so we started to develop the second age of water. This was when science and technology began to play a role in helping us understand what we were doing to our water resources and helping us understand how to access the water we needed in a much more concentrated, intense way. So we started to build dams and irrigation systems and water treatment plants and massive distribution systems that basically characterize water today. But the second age of water is also ending. We are moving into a time when the manipulations of the second age also are not enough. They have massive contamination, overdraft, and unsustainable use of water. We have contamination of water resources, water-related diseases, and I have argued that we need a new way of thinking about water. That's where the third age comes in. The third age is ultimately going to have to be a sustainable water management system. We are going to have to learn to live within our means. We are going to have to learn that ecosystems are a critical component of our water cycle, that it's not just humans alone, that it's humans and the natural environment together. The third age ultimately is going to have to be a sustainable age. So that's the end of the quote. But what I've been trying to say, the point I'm trying to make is that what all of you will learn in the next four days is absolutely critical to solving the current conflicts, conflicts that India is experiencing today. You will learn about people, the environment, about sharing, about power structures, about cultures, about the painstaking nitty gritty of getting people to sit across in dialogue and hammer out solutions. But we also need to keep our mind fully open to new ideas and to believe in the human capacity to innovate. You know, uh, Joy was talking about, he showed us the uh, newspaper clippings about Bangalore. Let me tell you, I lived here in the 90s also, and those were much more violent demonstrations. Lives were lost, days of product, days the city had come to a standstill. So if you were to compare, actually you could say there's a downward trend in the conflict. It really depends on the perspective that you take. It was contained quickly because the eye of the media, the eye of the nation, the eye of the world was on Bangalore and the Kaveri Basin. And you could look at what had happened in those years. It was horrible. And uh, this was also horrible. But if you were to take a dispassionate look at the conflict, we could say 
well, maybe people are beginning to learn, though it doesn't look like that today. But if you compare it, it might look like that. My point is we have to keep our minds open. Um, I was talking about the human capacity to innovate. Now, look at desalination. How many people's hair stands on end when I say desalination? Because you've all, we've all been trained to know that it's a horrible thing. <laughs> okay? Sometimes in the sector, we do look like that. It looks ecologically unsound. It looks financially terribly unsound, right? Who agrees with me? Okay, not everybody. Some of us. Who thinks desalination is ecologically and financially unsound? Okay, a few hands are up, a few hands are down. Okay, so what if I stepped into the mind of what I call a techno-optimist? Okay, I've met many of them in my life. So usually it's a he, but uh, so the, these techno-optimists will look around and say, Good God, we are living in a planet full of water. How can there be water shortages, right? So I know, I know what, what you're thinking, Joy. But uh, what if, what if, and the what ifs are very important in human history, okay? What if we figured out a much cheaper, less energy embedded way to desalinate? What if, what if we figured out what to do with the effluents? and figured out how, from where to harvest that water, where to put back the salt, how to not impact on the pH balance of the coastal areas, which we see as huge problems today, okay? What if? I'm not gonna comment on, on, on this. I'm saying we have to keep it open, not shut our minds down. That's all the request I'm making. And we keep our minds and hearts open as we look into the future, as we look into even the deeper and more politically complicated questions of issues like the Kaveri and Mahanadi basins, or even the conflicts just around a local aquifer or even the local uh, tap. So I would say as we look at how we address water conflicts, we must um, very self, uh, we must be self-aware, we must have a self-critique, and we must be open, and we must think of different scenarios from different perspectives and say, if you are going to work in this sector, and I hope many of you will, what is the biggest bang for the buck? Is it better to sit and work with the politicians or is it better to sit and work with the farmers? Is it better to go to industry or is it better to help people change their eating behavior? Or maybe it's necessary to all of them. How will we, based on our priorities and our passion, focus our laser focus our work so that we really get the best returns and we can reduce the human damage and the ecological damage from unnecessary uh, of water conflicts i wish you all the best in these next four days you're going to learn a lot um, you should have got a couple of extra brains with you i always feel cows have four stomachs why don't we have four more ability to attach more brains uh, you're going to be i feel if how many of you are going to take water conflicts work seriously there you go, almost every hand went up. I, I'll tell you this for sure. You all are going to be the most important people in this country, along with our uh, many leaders, because this water management, reducing conflict, thinking of future generations, thinking of our fragile ecosystems is going to be the most important work. You cannot have economic growth without doing that. You cannot bring prosperity without doing that. You cannot have peace without doing that. And so all of you are going to be the future VIPs. Maybe I should take your autographs right now. Thank you for listening to me and all the very best. Namaste.